Welcome to Rational Alchemy TV. Here are some things that I've never seen. A ghost or an angel or a prescient dream. A UFO photo at a decent zoom. Jesus standing there like he was me or you. A best-selling psychic win the lottery. A double-blind test for homeopathy. A proselytizer who made me think. Or a can of beer I didn't want to drink. I even like them warm. <coughs> See, what I want is knowledge and fun. Knowledge and fun. Knowledge and fun. The things that I want, they're knowledge and fun. Knowledge and fun. Welcome knowledge to Rational Alchemy. This is episode one. Yes, it followed episode zero, but episode one is where I have a real guest rather than Tom. Anyway, I would like to introduce Jamie Folsom, a, a very good friend of mine from Fort Collins area, um, and we have some stories to tell. Jamie, thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you. I'm glad to be here. Mostly. Mostly? Oh, you didn't exactly come down screaming, did you? <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe you did. Anyway, Jamie and myself used to be at uh, KRFC, uh, a very excellent little community radio station in Fort Collins. 88.9, there's a good plug for them. And Jamie and myself and a good friend of ours, Brian Walsh, we put together the original podcast radio show of Rational Alchemy. And Jamie, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we actually came up with the concept, how I brilliantly named it. You can now do your shut up, Nigel. <laughs> Shut up, Nigel. Thank you very much. And um, just let's talk a little bit about Rational Alchemy. So what, what are your first thoughts of uh, what we did back then? Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much known among my friends and even strangers that uh, um, I don't shy away from a debate or two, uh, particularly about uh, science or people's misconceptions about things. Um, you know, I'm Native American, I'm from the Choctaw tribe, and so there are a lot of misconceptions, for instance, about, you know, uh, the lived experiences of Native Americans. But um, I just happened to meet Brian, who also has the same sort of temperament, and um, we would debate back and forth uh, on science. We enjoyed a shared interest in science fiction, for instance, and. And, um, you know, just any kind of thing that actually people um, in our favorite pub, Avos, would throw our way. And people would kind of throw out an idea at Brian or me, and then we would just go for it. And uh, sometimes we ended up uh, in uh, very heated debates over it. Um, but it was nice to have a, f a friend who didn't hold back, who uh, didn't mind calling me out if I said something that was, you know, blatantly what he believed to be untrue, and likewise. I mean, we had this shared respect, uh, sense of humor, uh, and all of that. And um, so uh, we just decided that this might fit in with what you and Brian had talked about together and your friendship and That's how that right. developed. Because um, I got tied in with KRFC to do a music show which was Your Mother Wouldn't Like It. And at the time, the show used to go out at 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock on a Saturday night, which was always a lot of fun. And um, I started going across to Arvo Grande's, which is uh, just across the road from, uh, from KRFC, to have a couple of beers before I did my show, because like that, I could do a two-hour show. And by the time the show ended, my blood alcohol level was way low again, and uh, I could safely drive home. So um, I started going across to Arvo's, which, by the way, is one of the best music joints in the whole of Fort Collins. Um, just wonderful musicians that they get there. And um, I started going to Arvo's, having my Guinness, and I bumped into this strange creature called Brian Walsh. So Brian and myself started chatting, and just like Jamie, we discovered we had an interest in science, an interest in science fiction, and just some of the general nonsense that is, that is talked about. At the time, of course, uh, Battlestar Galactica was in, uh, was in full force, 
And uh, we, we could sit there and we'd, we'd talk about the previous week's uh, episode and start dissecting it and talking about it and uh, what a show that was except for the final six episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> which, which, which we totally did rip apart on Rational Alchemy. Um, and all of a sudden, rather than just myself and Brian, it was now myself, Brian and Jamie. And we used to share a bear, and we used to go in there, and we used to talk about it, and then all of a sudden, some bright spark, and I can't remember which of us it was, said, you know what, we ought to do a rational, we ought to do a, a, a sceptical show. Do you want to talk a little bit about... Uh... <laughs> well, you know, at that time, I was a radio journalist, well, I was multimedia journalist, and, um, and I did the news mm -hmm. uh, at KRFC Community Radio. Um, so I had access and the, the know-how to put together interviews and things like that. And I thought, well, that would be easy to do. Why don't we try it? Um, you know, we just sit down and we'll, we'll talk and we'll see what happens. We'll see what kind of interesting things that we can capture um, with the recording equipment. And we did that. Um, I, I literally dragged Brian, who had said for ages, oh, I really want to do a radio show at the station. You know, it's just right across there. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I, yeah, I should do radio. I, you know, I have a great voice. He always said that. Um, and I said, <laughs> okay, time to shut up or put up, Brian. Let's go, you know. And uh, so we went across the way and uh, recorded a, um, what was it, a couple of hours? A couple of hours of recordings, yes. Um, and and it, I, I edited it down, and so it's kind of a semblance of a show, of a back we, and forth. We have to remember yeah. that Brian was pretty legless at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Brian was never that legless, trust me. Uh, he was always on his feet uh, yeah. mentally, and I... Um, you know, have to say that I miss I miss those times because it's it's very rare that you get uh, two, much less three people who are on similar wavelengths and have enough similarity in their interests, but very different perspectives, to have um, a presence in radio and to just sit down and hash out some issues, cover some things. Um, say like um, the anti-vaccine movement, for instance. Um, that was one of our first topics that it we was. covered because it was very important. And being a com community radio station, um, you know, I felt as a news journalist that that was an important public information piece. Mm -hmm. um, Brian felt that it was, you know, science education and getting to the heart of why people make the decision not to vaccinate their kids, what the consequences for that are. And at the time, people like Jenny McCarthy and Jim Carrey were out in the public as celebrities, um, actively working against public health initiatives to vaccinate children. Right. So, all, be all because Wakefield had totally manipulated seven to nine children unbelievable. and um, yeah, very poor science very poor science they discovered that he was actually being paid by the insurance companies um, because they wanted to have massive lawsuits against the vaccination companies right I mean uh, this all came out of course later right uh, right and, and it was interesting the way that we did the show because I was still doing your mother wouldn't like it uh, the music show, but what I did was I dedicated a 15 to 30 minute time slot where, where sort of like after about 11 o'clock, now my show had moved, it's now 10 o'clock to midnight, so uh, about 11 o'clock um, we used to come into the studio, sometimes it was pre-recorded when you had done phone interviews, mm -hmm. uh, and then other times of course we actually just talked live. And I like the whole concept of, uh, of Rational Alchemy because uh, Brian always did the news. He always did the skeptical news of the week. And that was always a very facet. Some of the tidbits that he found were absolutely wonderful. Right. They were wonderful. Yeah. And, you know, actually that was at a time when the Internet was really starting to be a source of excellent information on... Um, investigative reporting, uh, sharing of information uh, to a very, very <coughs> wide audience. And so, you know, he picked out some great stories. Um, you know, I, we always had some commentary afterwards, a little 
uh, actually most of it was just spontaneous talking about it was. you know I didn't know that wow you know um, let's well let's talk about that and then bigger picture of you find this tidbit and why in the world would Jenny McCarthy for instance yes come out and and say the things that she did um, because her indigo child turned out to be not so <laughs> indigo, so therefore she must be autistic, which had to have been caused by the vaccinations that she was given. Right, and she, didn't she even write a book about how she cured her child um, with a diet, a, yes, a different diet, correct. and then which she no later... One, which, and let's, let's add in here, which right? no one has been able to replicate. No, not, not in any form, not in any shape, none. In fact, all of the um, research that's been churned out just to address that one Andrew Wakefield mm -hmm. um, is, I, I think it's, it's good because it says where autism does not come from. It doesn't come from vaccines. Right. It's not, there's no association with it. There's no um, cause and effect, of course, you know. And um, she later recanted and said, well, I guess he didn't have autism after all. Yes. You know, uh, but it was too late. That was 10 years. It was. Of pounding this information in, you know, on the Oprah show mm -hmm. and whatever was on the Oprah show, you know. That's golden. Right. And that was the end of me uh, thinking anything uh, positive about Oprah. Mm -hmm. But uh, it had it's, widespread it's, effects. It's funny you should say that. I felt exactly the same way. She blew all her credibility Absolutely. when she started to get on those guests. Yeah. And she yeah. had a series of them. Right. And she so, still has them. And she still has them. <laughs> uh, just amazing. Sorry, I didn't yeah. mention Oh, no, 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 no. Um, uh, this is how it goes. So, you know, there's always one little thing would lead us down a rabbit hole of discussion. Mm -hmm. And um, I always thought it was pretty good quality questions because... We, we, as just, you know, everyday skeptics, you know, you're in business, you know, I'm a teacher, uh, you know, Brian had his job. We're just everyday folks, but we have questions too. But as skeptics, we learned, the three of us, helped one another find where on the vastness of the Internet do you go for good information about science? Mm -hmm. Where do you go for intelligent um, discussion where do you who do, where do you find other people who are like-minded enough to say we have a common commitment to seeking out the truth talking about it exploring things with an open mind that's not so open that things just fall through right not none of the three of us is a sieve for sure but we're very particular about who we listen to, uh, where we go for news, uh, where we go for our science information. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say that for me personally, that was uh, one of the beauties of participating in community radio was finding people I wouldn't have found otherwise. Right. And having this ongoing friendship and ongoing discussion, even now we're still talking about. We're still talking about it. We're still talking about a lot of those issues because there's still you know, a part of the public discussion. Right. I, I can remember during the, uh, the anti-vaxxers discussion that we then had that, uh, I can't remember his name now, he was a doctor from Seattle, if memory serves me well, and he started going on about uh, the amount of mercury. Oh, right. So we had to, we did a couple of shows explaining, and I can't remember uh, what the actual terms are now. Uh, hits me on forehead. Um, but there are two types of mercury. E ethanol, yeah. ethyl, ethanol. I'm sorry. No. Ethyl and methyl. Oh, that's right. Ethyl and methyl. Yeah. <laughs> Not ethanol. <laughs> that, was, <yeah. laughs> that was a different day. <laughs> there it was. Um, and in fact, um, a can of tuna. Oh, that's right. E um, was it methyl? Methanol? Methyl mercury ha is the lesser of the two. There, Can there's, you remember? I can't remember which, but one of them is slightly larger. Yes. As a, as as a, a molecule, molecule than the other and is not easily absorbed. Right. And I think that's methyl alcohol. I think that's the methyl. And the thing that's tiny and that accumulates, we call it bioaccumulation, right? Mm -hmm. Each thing that eats the next thing up, yes. it accumulates and accumulates. And uh, so when we eat fish, they have the, the um, 
mercury that's the smaller that's right. and, and it you know it gets into the cells more gets easily into the cells, yeah and so it's absorbed and it stays and the the other mercury and I'm not going to claim that it is methyl but <laughs> uh, we need a fact check yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it does not and it passes easily through your system well, yes but that's not what we eat when we eat a can of tuna or that's, a tuna sandwich that, that's correct and we have more mercury in fish for that's instance. right so than um, we ever did in any type of uh, vaccination no absolutely absolutely yes I know when you left the show and uh, we got Jeff Wag involved mm -hmm. which was um, you did the show for about a year uh, about Two years? Oh, two years, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. It was, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. And that was fun. <laughs> um, we then got Jeff Wack, and we did, in fact, continue the story of mercury and power stations and just how much mercury is in the environment. Right. And, of course, being topical, now we have the Flint water crisis. Right. Which has brought the whole thing to a massive head. But what is such a shame is the anti-vaccination group is still going. It is. It's amazing how I do not know. They have been discredited so often. But and, well, we've learned a lot about that part of the question. Anyway, why do people persist in, uh, in believing this? So there are a couple of things that we've learned, and I say we, anybody who's interested in finding out why, um, but the CDC has done a lot of research on uh, decision making about mm -hmm. health issues, uh, decision making for one's children and who does that for the family. Almost always it's the, the woman, uh, the mother, the mm -hmm. children. Um, and and uh, where do they get their information to make their decision? And by and large, um, you know, they, their goal, the CDC's goal and, and uh, the National Institute of Health had been to how can we reach out to people to get people to change their mind about that? One, how can we get them to change their behavior so that they're vaccinating, more people are vaccinating their children? Because this isn't a, just some theoretical question. This is children dying, children getting sick. Um, I'll relate to you maybe another time about my, my journey with whooping cough. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how my children almost became orphans um, due to non-vaccinated kids. So they're, they're looking at, well, how do people make that decision? Uh, there are plenty of people out there uh, who are saying, well, I don't think that my kid's um, immune system can handle all of these shots at, at, at once. once. Right, and, and you know, over the period of the first three years, very vulnerable. And um, so the rational thing to say, or the skeptical thing, is to say, well, why do you suppose they give infants that young so many vaccinations? It's because they are vulnerable. And in some cases, you can't give vaccinations until they're, you know, six years, um, six months old or so on. So from that time when they're newborn, they are very vulnerable. So this, this is a, a very deadly serious question we're talking about and and why do people persist even knowing that these are deadly diseases um, so the the how do how do we reach them what kind of information how do we deliver that message that's important that may make them rethink mm -hmm. their entrenched yeah. thinking unfortunately any kind of approach that you make that's direct uh, entrenches them further into their corner and into their decision. And this is something we've seen in other kinds of very serious deliberate uh, um, uh, decision making for people. You know, why did you follow your captain's orders when they said to shoot down those children? Mm -hmm. I was just doing my duty. I really um, had distanced myself. Defense. Right, exactly. I, I really didn't know what I was doing by that point. Right. You know, and just like very firmly entrenched that they somehow had lost their ability to think and make the, well, it wasn't my decision to make and so on. Just to say yes. that. So you see that same thing happening with parents deciding not to do it. Right. Uh, and it's it goes in 
the direct, you know, flies in the face of, yes. of facts and, and history and what we've seen. Other people have, um, it, it, okay, so overall I would say that that decision making is compromised by fear and mistrust. Right. And the, um, <clears throat> for instance, in the Native community, um, you'll see 70% uh, of us live in urban areas. And yet, um, you know, the, that 70% is very likely to get vaccines because in urban areas, the public health initiatives are just what you do. That's what you do. Why wouldn't I vaccinate my kid, yes. you know? And it's safe, nobody's died, you know, it's, it's, um, it's just like that. But you get out into rural areas where there's already mistrust of the government and then you get into native communities where there's really Real mistrust. mistrust. Ever since the 1760s when yes. the smallpox blankets were sent our way, um, you see a, a, a degradation of believing in Western medicine. Mm -hmm. You see uh, government policies and the CDC and the uh, NIH, uh, the BIA, the Indian Health Service, all are part of the government and that has and and there are some very serious stories that still continue today so it's not like it was something historical that doesn't happen today mishandling underfunded you name it it's yes. rife for things to continue to um, substantiate that thought in somebody's head and so it's very deeply entrenched in some people's minds that they are no way are going to give their precious children uh, to over to anything Western medicine. Right. And um, so it is understandable at a certain way, but it's also like, well, let's go back and visit that smallpox. How many Native people have died of smallpox since the U.S. government has been vaccinating your children against smallpox. Mm -hmm. Zero. Zero. Yep. Zero. Uh, we do see smallpox outbreaks happening, uh, not necessarily anywhere near reservations or anything like that. I mean, in the United States, but uh, but that's an irony. And I've always wanted to do. This is still the the journalist in me. I wanted to do a photo essay on Native Americans showing their smallpox scars. Mm -hmm you know, as a public health campaign to say, you know, 120 years. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm, I'm a photographer, you're a journalist, maybe we should team up on I, this. And, I think that's um, a good idea. I don't want to shake on it today. No, but, <laughs> 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 but, uh, but yes, I mean, there's, um, there are things that still fly in the face of that, but it's an emotional decision and right. it's based in fear, whether that fear has uh, history or not. Now, I'm also going to say something pretty classist here. Right now, we know that in Larimer County, we have a very low vaccination rate. Boulder County, we have a very low vaccination rate. But it's not minorities. It's not people coming from rural areas who are afraid of the government. Um, it is well-educated, middle class, upper middle class, white women making and leading these decisions. It's Jenny McCarthy's. Right. It's the Jenny McCarthy's among us, although probably more highly educated. I can't say for sure Jenny that McCarthy. That wouldn't actually be that difficult, but. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but that is who right. is opting out for various reasons. And, and I think it's really important that we, we talk a little bit here, because we haven't actually mentioned it, Vaccinations have absolutely nothing to do with the individual. Nothing at all. It is to do with the herd. That is what vaccinations are trying to protect, the herd. Do vaccinations occasionally, very, very occasionally, and you can get the statistics on the uh, CDC website, do they actually, um, can they affect people? Yes, unfortunately, they can. It does happen very, very occasionally. But the whole concept of a vaccination is to protect the herd. 
Um, we saw the measles outbreak that happened in California and quickly spread. And what's truly worrying now is they're very, very worried, not about smallpox, but about polio. That's ridiculous. This is 2016. We nearly had it totally eradicated. It nearly became a part of total history. In fact, we don't do polio vaccines. No, because we didn't think we had to, but no. maybe now we need to start. I know that we could we could chatter on about this for <laughs> oh vaccines, rough vaccines. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I also know that uh, sometime in the future I'd like to sit down with you and discuss the uh, African American uh, idiot. Nigel. We could do that too. The native, <laughs> the, na the native American, and talk a, a lot about uh, the history that, that that actually happened from the 1700s or the 1600s. But what I'd like 1400s. to do, or 1400s. <laughs> well, we could probably go back about what seven or eight thousand years, actually. But that, that, we won't go back that far. Well, but we're what talking I, post Columbus. Post Columbus. But what I'd like to do is also talk a little bit about Skeptic Camp, mm -hmm. because I know that you are very, very active in the Skeptic Camp uh, community. So why don't you? I've been involved with Skeptic Camp on a couple of occasions. Why don't you talk just a little? We'll give them a plug. Okay. Basically. All right. <laughs> because so, the, the, this is very important mm. uh, because this does actually tie in very nicely with the um, with the discussion that we've just had. And uh, Skeptic Camp is across the world. Jamie, take it away. Give a little five-minute <laughs> overview of Skeptic Camp. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So. Um, um, so after Brian and Nigel and I met, uh, you know, Brian and, and I had more friends join in the conversation and we found other people who were um, what we would call skeptics. And um, we decided to start getting together uh, and meet uh, on a weekly basis in this group because, you know, it's kind of hard to find uh, people who are willing to debate about the uncomfortable things of religion, sex, um, science, um, uh, you name it. And, and we, weren't, we weren't afraid to talk about those things. So it's hard to find sometimes people like that. Um, so some other mutual friends of ours started uh, Skeptics in the Pub in Fort Collins. We have been meeting ever since, um, I think that was about 2009, 2008, uh, meeting a weekly. And at some point we said uh, there was a, a new movement, it's called Skepticamp, and it's an annual conference, but it's not your typical conference. It's a kind where um, members of the group themselves come and get up and give presentations. And instead of inviting rock stars, you know, um, James Randi or anybody like that to the conference to speak, we speak among ourselves as citizens, as fellow skeptics. And um, instead of me giving some PowerPoint slide and saying, okay, that's it, I've talked about, you know, the um, myths ar around HIV, um, during the presentation, uh, we invite questions and comments. And afterwards, we give everybody, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes to engage in discussion about that topic. So it's not your typical conference. And right. that's what Skeptic Camp is. Yes. It started by um, a couple of Boulder-based skeptics, and including Reed Esau, yes. uh, who we've had we had on Rational we Alchemy. We had on Rational Alchemy many times. Right, and uh, so it, it's, you know, it's growing the skeptic community. We host it, the Skeptics in the Pub, and Fort Collins host it every year. It's usually in January, uh, and we try to reach out to the Colorado State University community and the rest of the Colorado community to come and participate. Um, Colorado Springs, uh, Denver, um, have also hosted Skeptic Camp events, and I just, can't say enough about how fun it is right. to talk well, well, with people who are smart, you yes. know, and ask questions and not afraid to talk about uncomfortable subjects. That's right. That's right. Skeptic Camp is, uh, is a worldwide organization. Um, they have Skeptic Camps in all of the major capital cities around the world. And uh, over here in America, of course, they even take place in those little out-of-the-way forgotten places like Fort Collins. <laughs> <laughs> 
What? what? Wait a minute. <laughs> has, oh, I'm sorry. Has Longmont hosted a skeptic camp lately? No, no. We're more forgotten than Fort Collins. <laughs> okay. <is>. All right. <laughs> and we intend to keep it that way. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Jamie, it's been an absolute pleasure. And my uh, some of the things that we've talked about today has made my mind go in lots of different directions. <laughs> and I know I want you back. Okay. Without a shadow of a doubt. All right. But uh, And it would be so great if we could get Brian here as well. I know. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We'd, then, we'd have to fly him in, though. We'd have to fly He's, him in, though. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, well, Brian. Maybe Skype him in. We could, yeah, he could actually, be a talking head right here. There we go. <laughs> actually, I'll do a hand puppet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, let me. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, once again, thank you so, so much. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> to the future. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to the show. This was another edition uh, over and done with. Rational Alchemy, signing off from the Captain's Lounge. Thank you. Knowledge and fun. Knowledge and fun. Knowledge and fun. The only things better than love and happiness are knowledge and fun. Knowledge and fun. The only things better than love and Happiness are knowledge and fun, knowledge and fun, knowledge and fun. The Fox Network has sunk to a new low.